there are a lot of instances where ApoB slash LDL, we'll basically use those terms interchangeably in this podcast. They're not exactly the same thing, but they're looking at the same metric. They're looking at the same sort of particles in the human body. They don't always correlate with atherosclerosis, especially in people who have other indicators that their vasculature is healthy or that they are metabolically healthy. In humans that are metabolically healthy by a fasting insulin or by HDL to triglyceride ratio or by CAC scores, which is a coronary artery calcium score of zero, we don't see any real consistent sort of relationship between LDL levels and incident cardiovascular disease. So if ApoB slash LDL are causing atherosclerosis, why does this correlation, why does this association break down in people that are metabolically healthy? And this has been my concern. This has been my problem my sort of pushback to the mainstream ApoB lipid thinking for many years now, that it must be taken in context. I mean, years ago when I was on Joe Rogan's podcast, I showed him a graph of the Framingham study and I said, look, look at if what happens to the relationship between LDL cholesterol and cardiovascular disease if you stratify people in Framingham by HDL, which is just a proxy marker for some degree of metabolic health. It's not perfect. The relationship completely changes in people that have high HDL. And that's a single marker. You enumerated probably 12 markers, yep. right? So if you look at any marker that indicates metabolic health, you will see the relationship between LDL and cardiovascular disease either massively attenuated or completely fall away. So what is going on here? How can LDL be causing atherosclerosis? And I think it's just, it, we get into this idea of semantics, and I don't think we need to go too far down this rabbit hole, but that's the question that we're really asking overall. That's the question I was trying to ask Derek on his podcast. And that's the question that I think has been glossed over repeatedly by mainstream medicine. And I think this is because of these Mendelian randomization relationships between LDL and cardiovascular disease. And this is why I really wanted to go on Derek's podcast. Now, he brought up a bunch of stuff that he didn't tell me we were going to discuss. And this is why we're having this podcast with you and I to kind of fill in the gaps there. But if you look at the high end of a Mendelian randomization, which is a type of study that looks at genetic polymorphisms that lead to, in this case, higher levels of LDL and the genetic polymorphisms that lead to lower levels of LDL, is there a relationship between LDL level and cardiovascular disease? And indeed there is, if you look at some of these studies. Now, the problem that I had with this, and this is what I told Derek on the high end, was that, hey, the people at the high end of the Mendelian randomization, those are people with something called familial hypercholesterolemia, which is technically a, quote, phenotype, but it's really a genetic thing. This has always been distasteful to me. And the, as I mentioned on the podcast with Derek, to Derek, this is what I wanted to go on and educate him about. People with especially monogenic familial hypercholesterolemia, which means familial hypercholesterolemia caused by one single gene mutation, have very clear changes in the way that their immune cells function. The, the propensity of the macrophages to take up LDL in the vessel wall is, is, is much higher. So people with familial hypercholesterolemia don't just have high LDL. They have an immune system that wants to gobble it up and form plaques more avidly than someone that doesn't have it. So it's, a, it's an inaccurate representation, I think, of what's going on there. And as you mentioned, we can talk about this later in the podcast. We've, we've really seen this play out to some extent recently with Dave Feldman's study. I had Dave on the podcast. We talked about his, the beginning of his recent study with lean mass hyperresponders, which are people who eat low carb, something that I'm not a huge fan of, something that Mike is not a huge fan of. But we know that when you eat low carb in some some subset of people, your LDL will go high. And when I was strict carnivore, my LDL was much higher than it is now. And so Dave took people who were lean mass hyperresponders, that's his name for people who have high LDL in the setting of a low carb diet. And he did CCTA, which is basically coronary angiography, like CT coronary angiography. It's even more specific than a CAC, which is a coronary artery calcium score. And what he found with those people was that they did not have really any correlation between their level of LDL and the incidence of coronary vascular disease that they saw on a CCTA. And then he did this really genius thing. He compared them to a group at Miami Heart, which is a group of people that had a bunch of, of CT coronary angiograms that didn't have elevated LDL, quote. And there was the exact same incidence of cardiovascular disease in people with, quote, average LDL levels and people with significantly elevated LDL levels who were lean mass hyperresponders. So again, we're starting to see this play out that this doesn't always work, especially on the high end. And, you know, in these Mendelian randomizations, people on the high end are lean, are, are excuse me, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. 
But here's Dave's cohort, which I think, do you remember how many people were in the study? It's probably like, uh, they had, I don't have the exact numbers they, here. I think they had 70 or 80 people. Um, and they didn't, there, there's no correlation between, it was you know, 80. It was 80, 80, yeah. 80 people. There's no correlation between cardiovascular disease. So this is where we are. And this is where Mike and I start asking these questions. So why don't you, I'm curious, Mike, like what, what have you seen with regard to this? Because there are, why don't we just dig into a few of the studies that have been done looking at relationships between LDL cholesterol and cardiovascular disease in people who have an absence of some of these risk markers, right? So either people with zero CAC scores, so zero calcified plaque on a coronary artery calcium score, or other metrics that might suggest this, because this is actually pretty interesting data that I think people need to know about. So there's, a, there's quite a few interesting studies here that actually look at this. And so we have one with the, that was done by Dave Feldman and Matthew Budoff together. Uh, and then we also have one looking at familial hypercholesterolemia as well. And basically what we see with specifically to Dave Feldman's study, they had people with a mean LDLC. So the average LDLC was 272 milligrams per deciliter and a max of 591. So something to put into perspective here is this is not total cholesterol. This is just LDL cholesterol. And in these, in these studies, HDL also tends to be high. So total was significantly higher. And what they see is that there's no relationship in this study between LDLC elevations and plaque formation. They're not actually seeing any, any relationship. And there, there's an interesting graph where they show, like you can see the LDL values, you can see the plaque scores, and they're not correlated by any capacity. Some of the highest scores have zero plaque burden. So that's the first thing with, with these people with very high LDLC levels, and we're not seeing this, the, the positive or the CAC scores greater than zero or we're not seeing elevations in plaque burden overall as the CCTA or the CAC scores, which is, that's a huge, that's, <laughs> that's a huge uh, thing to see because ideally if you have this, if LDL is directly causative in cardiovascular disease, you would see, you would assume a linear relationship or some type of relationship, not necessarily always linear, where the higher levels that you get, the higher, the higher the plaque burden. And you're not actually seeing that. Another study that we have here it's titled Absence of Coronary Artery Calcification in Middle-Aged Familial Hypercholesterolemia Patients Without Atherosclerotic Cardiovascular Disease. What they basically show is that about 45% of these people don't actually show cardiovascular uh, a CAC score greater than zero. So what they say here in five of the nine included studies, so this is N equals 970, so 1,000 people almost were looked at, providing on-treatment lipids. Uh, the pooled on-treatment low-density lipoprotein cholesterol level was 158 milligrams per deciliter. So the people's average LDLC while they were on treatment for the high lipids was uh, 158 milligrams per deciliter. They said among these nine studies representing these 1,176 asymptomatic uh, heterozygous uh, familial hypercholesterolemia patients, the mean pooled prevalence of CAC equal to zero was 45%. So basically, you have about 1,176 people that have uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, so they have the genetic condition that leads to high cholesterol. And basically, uh, they had a, the average LDLC of 158, which would be considered quite high by modern standards, and their CAC scores 45% of them was zero. So 45% of these people with FH, with familial hypercholesterolemia, and elevated LDLC levels are not seeing CAC scores greater than zero and they're middle-aged people. This is not in young, young familial hypercholesterolemia people. So you have, you have incidents, you have studies like this. Then there's a variety of other studies where basically there's some really interesting ones where they're stratifying people's, uh, their LDL values into different categories. And then they're basically seeing that in each category, whether LDLC was 77 milligrams per deciliter or whether it was 190 milligrams per deciliter, again, LDL, not total cholesterol. If their CAC scores were zero, they basically had a minimal risk of cardiovascular events and, and uh, they, weren't really, like, they weren't really showing increased heart attacks and all this type of stuff, with, with, even with these high LDLC levels. So basically what we're seeing here is that the number one most important thing is do you have black burden? And maybe LDL is associated with black burden. Well, we know it is. And to some extent, but the association doesn't necessarily mean direct causation. 
And we're there. The what happens is when we start to get into the weeds with these studies, and you really can get into the weeds with these studies. What you see is because LDL is involved in plaque formation, there's going to be associations, but it doesn't necessarily mean that LDL by itself is just the driving factor for plaque formation and cardiovascular disease. There's a variety of other factors that are occurring that are leading to changes and modifications in LDL, which we can talk about. And that's usually driven by metabolic dysfunction and by inflammatory signaling and oxidative stress that modify LDL particles, trigger immune response, and then you start to get plaque formation. And so when, if we just hyper-focus on these LDL, on these LDL values, and I mean like, oh, we need to just smash LDL all the way down less than 30 milligrams per deciliter with drugs so we can lower our risk. It's like, I guess that's one way that you could go about it, but it's kind of a crude fashion to go about treating heart disease when we need to, like the LDL itself needs to be modified and have this inflammatory signaling process and all this type of stuff go on to actually have this effect. And if anything, in different animal studies, when you knock out the inflammatory signaling through genetic deletion pathways, or you adjust some of the, some of the different, um, some of the different receptors with antibodies or things like this, you actually completely eliminate or vastly emin- eliminate atherosclerosis in these animals, even when they have really high uh, LDL values. Because again, it's, it's the, the, the atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease is kind of like a cake. There's a lot of ingredients that have to go into this to have the effect instead of just, you wouldn't just say, oh, it's just the frosting on the cake that's causing the problem because that's what we see. It's like, no, there's multiple pieces going into making this problem. And we need to understand those pieces all together instead of just really hone in on one, throw all of our eggs in one basket, and then try to smash it down with drugs when there's problems with doing that that are not being discussed openly by these other parties, including Derek on the podcast. So there's, those are, we need to understand risk versus reward, and we need to understand the actual mechanisms before we make extreme treatment decisions. And that, I think that's one of the major problems that we're seeing with this, this other model that's being, that's being pushed. It's like, it's just LDL, we just need to smash it. And it's like, but there's all these paradoxes. So like, why don't we try to understand what's going on instead of really just hone in on this one thing? Like for me, it's, it doesn't make any sense to just go really hard on this, especially because we're seeing people where LDL is super high and they're not having the, they're not having high plaque burdens. They're not seeing increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And if anything, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence from keto people saying, Hey, I went keto and I actually improved my CAC scores and things like this. Now, this isn't me saying that, that, you know, people need to go on keto to do that. It's just me saying like, look, these are states where people get really high LDL values and they're eating a bunch of saturated fat. And they're saying, Oh, things are actually improving for me overall. And that's quite an interesting, that's quite an interesting profile because it's completely counter to the current narrative. So there's a big paradox there and it needs to be rectified. And that's basically what we're trying to do here is figure out like, what is this, what, it, where is the paradox and like, why are we seeing this? And because the general model, I don't think is correct.